Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. This evening, Tom Poland is training us on how to generate new clients virtually every week with webinars. Tom, welcome all the way from Brisbane, Australia. G'day, Roger. Close. A couple <laughs> of hours north of Brisbane. Okay. Tom, a couple of questions just by way of mini interview. Sure. Uh, you literally uh, wrote the book on marketing with webinars, that yellow mm -hmm. book right behind you, uh, which I'm proud to say I have read cover to cover. <clears throat> cool. Please uh, tell cool. us cool. one thing that you would like uh, most, uh, uh, one thing that you would like most about marketing with webinars. Um, I, to, for me, it's the, it's the cultural diversity that, that I experience. So we have, and typically we run webinars, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, we're 1 p.m. Pacific, that's 6 or 7 a.m. here in Australia, depending on what time of year, 9 p.m. in the UK, 10 p.m. in Germany. So we, we, we quite often have, you know, 15, 20, 30 different uh, nationalities on a webinar. When we run the smaller webcams on webinars like this, there's, there's a, it's very interesting, the cultural diversity that, that comes with that. And it's the same deal with, with, with client work. You know, we get a lot of cultural diversity. So that's what I like most about it. And you know, so as, a, as someone who's a background in marketing, running physical events where you have seminars and workshops and you're marketing those, it's just a joy and a delight to be able to walk down you know, my commute instead of hopping on a plane and hiring a, a taxi. My commute is from the, from the kitchen espresso machine down the hallway. <laughs> I really like that as well. Right, right. In the, your decades of doing webinars, what is the one or two reasons that people consistently give you for not doing webinars? Right. Well, pre-COVID, pre they said, well, you can't do marketing with webinars. You've got to be there in person. You've got to be there in, in the room physically. A lot of people change their perspective on that. Um, so in the surveys that we've done, we've done, you know, I've surveyed thousands and thousands of people, 12% say they don't do marketing with webinars because the technology scares them. Only 12%, which is quite interesting. It used to be much higher than that. It used to be over 60%. But these days, the two biggest reasons that people give is they don't know where to get fresh audiences from. Uh, we've already had someone on a call saying, I'm here, you know, he said, he said, I'm here because we keep running these webinars, but no one shows up. So where do you get fresh audiences from? That's one of the two biggest questions. And the second one is how do I create content that's engaging and interesting? And I don't, you know, look like a doofus and bore people. <laughs> and, and you're so going to help us in both those areas tonight. Yeah, well, I hope, hopefully we can, yeah. yeah. Lovely. So um, audience, uh, uh, feel free to type any questions you've got into the chat. And uh, at intervals during Tom's talk, Tom's talk is uh, just a little bit under 90 minutes, <laughs> 9 zero. Uh, I will uh, uh, pause and pose your questions uh, to Tom. Uh, the recording of this uh, training session will be made public uh, as soon as humanly possible, me being the human. So I'll shoot for no later than noon tomorrow. Uh, Tom, are you ready to rock the stage? Ready to rock and roll, sir. Then she's all yours. You take her away. Well, let's, all right, let's, let's take it away. So, um, folks, what I think we'll do is we might just kick off and just find out who's on the call. So we will go boom, pull the curtains back, and I'll ask you to type in the city you're in, the service you offer, and who your ideal client is. So if it was me, I'd type in Castaways Beach, marketing with webinars, and... I did probably type in people marketing services, advice or software. So go ahead, um, the city you're in, the service you offer and the client. Let's get those fingers typing and we'll see who we've got on the call. So this is gonna help me a lot to, uh, so we've got Michael who's in Vancouver doing dental implants, his target market of dentists. Uh, Vancouver, Liz, digital marketing students. Nick in Sydney, procurement services, financial planner. Andrea, just north of New York. Storytelling, ambitious people. Oh, lovely. Yep. Uh, thanks, Roger. Stephen, Orlando, Florida. Up late, Stephen. Better be interesting, huh? <laughs> I bet you'll fall asleep. You're going to fall asleep, turn your webcam off. Um, Las Vegas, lead generation, funnel efficiency, coaching, solopreneurs, local business owners, coaches. Uh, gut health, professional woman with gut health issues. Thanks, Andrea. 
All right. So good, good to know. So everyone's going to get value from this. The people that are going to get the most value are going to be people marketing services, advice, or software. Uh, if you have a physical product, you'll still get some ideas from this because you can, you can use marketing webinars to, to market Lear jets if you want to. Uh, but we're going to be talking mostly about people marketing ideas, services, software. So just a little bit about my background. Some of you will know Australia. That's where Sydney is. That's where Melbourne is. Uh, New Zealand's over here, which is where I used to live. I'm actually a Kiwi. And I flew over on a big silver bird, I don't know, about 15 or 18 years ago. And the reason I moved to Australia from New Zealand, even though New Zealand is this beautiful country, uh, is because of this, this stuff that you see up here, the blue sky, because New Zealand's a very green country, but it's green for a really good reason. They get a lot of rain. And so this is actually literally where I live, just up here. And you can see a short walk down to the beach. There's 200 houses and where I live in Castaways Beach, you can probably just about count them all there. And, and I moved here for lifestyle reasons. I had been flying around the world, doing speaking, running conferences, workshops, seminars, I uh, had a couple of businesses in different countries and then sold all that and uh, moved here and thought, well, what am I going to do with my time? And this, we're going back to 2008 when I made this transition. And that's when I discovered this thing called webinars. And I thought, well, that's very clever, isn't it? There's the web and then there's the seminar and you put the two words together and you get webinar. So I thought, that's really cool. So I got up at like, I still remember, I got up at like three o'clock in the morning because this thing called a webinar was going to be on. And of course, it was being run in the States which generally means a very early morning for me. And I remember getting up three o'clock in the morning and sitting in front of this computer and being bored out of my skull because it was deaf by bullet point. Yes, it was a webinar, but it sure wasn't very interesting. But nevertheless, I went back to bed thinking, I think there's something in this. And I had some legacy clients that I was working with as, as a consultant. And I said to them, why don't we, instead of me flying to see you, why don't we try doing some of these meetings with video conferences? And this was 2008, it was pretty formative days, but, but we did that. And they just loved the fact that we could just click start a meeting like that and we stopped and everyone was back at work straight away and, and I didn't have to leave home which I quite like so of course with COVID-19 uh, my services have you know like it's, it's the weirdest recession is it because you've got some industries that have taken off like you can't couldn't buy a webcam for love and money for a few months there toilet paper gee I wish I'd thought about making that stuff because that that flew off the shelves so you have these silos in industries that have just gone boom and you've other silos, such as airlines, obviously, and you know, hospitality and so on, and that have gone not so good. But marketing webinars uh, has, I've been doing that for years pre-COVID. It's just become obviously a lot more popular now. So let's have a look at, I've got this agenda, but I'm really happy to chop and change and, and, and just give you exactly what you want. For me, this is not kind of some big marketing exercise. It's just sharing with some folks that I've, you know, friends who are strangers who about some ideas about what I found that works and what doesn't work. So... There's no credit card to pull out. Uh, there's nothing you, you know, to buy. I, I will give you an, an opportunity to reach out and talk to me at the end of the webinar if that seems appropriate. But other than that, it's kind of like your show. I'm here, I'm the guest, I'm, but I'm happy to share with you exactly what you need to know, whether it's audiences or content, whatever it happens to be. So backgrounder, we'll go through uh, who this is for, what's the benefit. My journey towards marketing webinars, which actually started 41 years ago, believe it or not, before, well before webinars. How well does it work? Uh, real quick on that. And then most of our time we'll spend here on this three-part model. Uh, how, how does the three parts to making webinars work? So, 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 so what does that look like? And what are the bits and pieces of that? It includes audiences and content. Um, so yeah, if there's any questions, Roger, just jump on any time. Uh, no questions interrupt. this far? We're all good so far. Okay, because I'll, I'll wrap it on forever unless, unless you stop me. So. Um, uh, in, in absence of an interruption, I'll assume I should keep going. So uh, you, you just this, keep going, and then if a webinar shows up, I'll I'll ask you if it's okay to interrupt, and if you say yes, that's everything in our business. I'll pose the question today on the podcast, Profit Answer Man. I share some tips on managing that flow. As it so, yeah, probably not a good idea to listen to a podcast while you're at a webinar. <laughs> Someone just got found out bad. Um, so yeah, shut down Outlook, shut down Facebook, because I mean, you can make a million dollars a year with this stuff, literally. So it's probably worth, probably worth listening to. Um, oops, that's embarrassing. All right, it's funny though. <laughs> we should just laugh about those sorts of things because this is what happens on webinars sometimes. All right, so this is for you if you offer advice, service, or software. Now the, my specialty is, is people of marketing actually a relationship. 
And then people aren't going to buy from you until they trust you. And it's very different with a set of golf clubs or a car because there's, there's a brand behind that, you know, Galloway are behind it or Ford are behind it or whoever, there's Tesla behind it or whatever. But when you, when you buy a, a, a product, you're entering into a relationship with a brand or a product, not the person. You don't have to particularly like the person who sells you that. The car, you know, we took a poll of everyone who, you know, fell in love with a car salesperson. It would probably be a pretty short, pretty short poll, right? So you don't have to like the person who sells you a product, a pair of running shoes or a golf clubs or makeup or whatever. You have to like the product. But when you're marketing advice services or software, you've got to be able to click with the person because you're going to be entering into a longer term relationship with them. And that, that one part there explains why most people fail in their marketing attempts because they do what I call premature proposals. So they go to a business networking meeting, put a business card out to everyone and so someone's going to ask them about the services. But when we're, when we're marketing advice services or software, it's far more like you're proposing marriage than it is selling a washing machine. That means you've got to give people a first date before you propose. <laughs> Uh, so, and, 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 I, and I, it's really simple and easy to say that, but most people miss it. Most people are still trying to market services, advice, or software almost at the first point of contact. And that's like proposing marriage without a first date. It also explains why social media marketing doesn't work particularly well if you're marketing advice or services or software. Social media marketing is, is, is the equivalent of speed dating. You know, you get six months with the brand, boom, you want to buy it. So it's not enough. Whereas when you invite people to attend a 60 or a 90 minute meeting, could be a 45 minute meeting, it's more like you're offering someone a night out on the town compared to speed dating. They're coming along to a webinar, they're gonna be with you for an hour or 90 minutes. It's really enough skin in the game for them to get to know you reasonably well to see if they've got that click, click, click with you. Uh, do, do they trust you? Uh, can you demonstrate professional uh, competency and so on and so on. They're able to experience all of that before they go to the next date with you. So the, and this is why marketing with webinars is perfect for people that have advice services software. You don't have to leave home. Prospects don't have to leave home. You can reach anyone in the world or you can reach out to the building next door to you, but it gives people that opportunity for the night out in the town with you, so to speak, uh, not speed baiting, not premature proposal, like straight off the bat, would you like SEO services today with that, like people do on LinkedIn? But it's, it's, just, it's just that sweet spot of enough skin in the game, but not too much for them to not want to, to move forward and, and, and attend your webinar. So my ideal client is where the average annual revenue from one sale is thousands of dollars or more. So if you have a $97 product, I would not go to all the bother of marketing with webinars because it's a lot to set up and it's just really not worth it. If I was offering a massage services or have a yoga class where people are paying like you know, 10 or $20 per session, it's not really worth doing setting the whole thing up, marketing webinars, because there's quite a lot of work in setting it up. But if you, so if that sounds like you, then you're in the right plot spot. Now, as I go through this, you can get value at hopefully at two levels. One is me speaking directly to you, but also what you can swipe and deploy. So right off the bat, uh, I got you engaged by asking you the city you're in, the service you offer, and your ideal client. So I got you thinking, and if people aren't typing or talking, they're not engaging. So if they haven't started typing, they haven't started talking, it's a pretty good rule to kick your webinars off by asking people to type something if it's a bigger webinar or talk if it's maybe a six or eight people that can, you can go around the room and people do introductions. If they haven't started typing, if they haven't started talking, they haven't started engaging. So get that off the bat straight away. And then what you want to do really early on is make sure they're in the right place. And this is a description of the demographic. And the second thing you want to do is give them a description of what we call the psychographic, which is why they might be here. So if this is you, you tell them this is a description of your ideal client, and then who want, or in my case, who like the idea of waking up every Monday morning and opening your meetings calendar to see multiple bookings from high quality, high qualified prospects who want to know more about working with you. So again, two levels. Hopefully that's a fair description of who you are and what you want. Psychographic being why people are buying or why they're coming to a webinar. Any questions on that so far? We're all good? Give us We're a thumbs up if you're good. No questions. Right. Okay. 
So um, let's let's keep going then. So that's a little bit about um, who marketing webinars is for. Let's um, have a look. My journey. To, I, so I started as a management consultant at age 24, and as you can tell you, that's you know probably see it's a couple of years ago, um, actually 41 years ago. <laughs> I started 24 year old management consultant. It's tough, you know, because as a management consultant, you're meant to have the voice of experience. You're meant to have the insights and have the astuteness. But 24 year old, it's like seriously. I mean, you're still wet behind the ears. And not only was I a 24-year-old management consultant, but I had, in those days, if you didn't have a bricks and mortar business, you didn't have a receptionist sitting behind a desk, um, if you didn't have an office lease, then you didn't really have a business. So I had all those things and I had mortgages and I had, in other words, I had a lot of overheads. And I, and I quickly figured out real fast that I had better be good at marketing. I had, I had to figure out how to get this consistent, this predictable flow of new clients coming in. So I read books, I went to seminars, I flew overseas to different workshops and so on. And I figured some stuff out, but mostly to start with, I just felt like nothing worked. And I call this the canyon. And it, see if you can relate to this. And I have, so a canyon obviously has two sides and it has this big gulf in the middle. So I'm gonna be real creative and I'm gonna call this side here, the left-hand side. And this side here, I'm gonna call the right hand side. Fortunately, the clouds are just in the right place so that you can see what I'm typing here. And the reason, the reason I'm going to tell you about the canyon is some of you will feel like you can relate to being stuck on the left hand side. Got a great product, but maybe you're feeling like you're the world's best kept secret. It's like, it's like you've got this 10 out of 10 product or service that people, when they engage with you, they love what you do and they keep coming back for more and they become great clients. But that 10 out of 10 product, it feels like it's trapped in two out of 10 marketing, right? So well, it's best kept secret sort of thing. That's what I felt like. So I felt like I was stuck on the wrong side of a canyon. On the side that I was on, my marketing was very, produced unpredictable results. It was unscalable because I was mostly going to business networking meetings and it was a one-on-one -on -one personal effort to overcome the inertia, go to conferences, go to business networking meetings, hand up my business cards and hope to get lucky, you know, commercially speaking. So it was unpredictable, it was unscalable. Random acts of marketing, you know, I'd wake up on a Monday morning and go, my God, where am I gonna get some more clients from? These days people go, oh, okay, I'll do a Facebook Live or I'll post something to LinkedIn or in those days you'd write an editorial for a, or try and get interviewed on a radio or something, send out direct mail letters. But it was all a bit random, it wasn't, it wasn't systemized. So there wasn't this predictability about it. Random acts of marketing produced what I call roller coaster revenue. So one month is up, one month is down, one quarter is up, one quarter is down, one year it's up, one next year it's down. It didn't have this consistent, even income. And that produced a lot of anxiety. So I would literally lie awake at night wondering where my next client was going to come from, wondering how I was going to pay the rent, the mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. So to cut a long story short, I could see that there were other firms out there that had seemed to have predictable, scalable, consistent, constant revenue flows. And it all seemed to me like if I had that, that, that would be a great sense of relief. Tommy, you open so, for a question? Yeah, please, fire away. How long did it take you to set up and consistently deliver webinars and get clients in your profession of management consulting? 11 years. Thank so you. Like I can show, but these days I show people how to do it in 12 weeks. Because I, because I, I, I did everything wrong. I mean, I, you know, as, as a marketer, I thought I knew something about marketing, but um, there was a whole lot of ways I could do this wrong. So it took me a long time to figure it out. It, it was, it was stop start. It was, I had some success and I thought I'd cracked the solution, the formula, but I hadn't. So, and, and it, I know it took 11 years. Yeah. Chris. About what year you, oh, or what, uh, what's the last number of the year that you got it right? Or what year did you get this right, do you think? 2016. Wow. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, so so, so let's, let's, let's go back. So I had to figure out how to get over the canyon, so to speak. And if I go back, because I clicked the clicker too fast, it's kind of like, you know, I had to build a bridge. and. I, had, I felt like I had the train stuck on this side of the canyon. I wanted to get the bridge over the, the train over the other side of the canyon. So quick question. What's the hardest part about getting a train from one side of the canyon to the other, would you think? You type, type the answer in. What's the hardest part about getting a train from one side of a canyon to another? 
Uh, yeah. Andrea says bridge, build the track over gate, go, got to solve the bridge solution. Building the bridge looks like bridge is the winner. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the winner. Yeah, it's laying down the train tracks, right? It's building the bridge. So you've got a, you've got a. It's nothing to do with the train, in other words. It's it's the train track. So this bridge and the train tracks. I use that as a metaphor for a series of systems because once you lay down train tracks and do it right, the train can't go anywhere else. There's a sense of inevitability or predictability about where the train's going to end up. And, and as I often say to people, you, you know, people don't have enough leads or don't have enough new clients. I say, you don't have a lead generation problem. They go, yeah, I do. I said, no, no, you have a lead generation system problem. And, that, and that's what I desperately wanted. I knew enough about marketing to know I had to systemize the thing if I wanted repeatability. But, but I desperately wanted to find out what systems that I need to have in place so that metaphorically speaking, the train that was my business would just run down those tracks and bring in new clients, client up, client up, client. There's actually four components to the whole system that starts with strategic advantage, but for the sake of time, I'm going to put that aside just for a moment, the competitive point of difference and the articulation as to why clients would want to work with you than one of your competitors. Let's just put that aside for a moment, strategy, and let's focus on systems that are more specific to webinars. The first thing is you need a system, again, train tracks are a metaphor for system. The sleepers in the train tracks are a metaphor for the step-by-step -step process to follow. You need a system for getting fresh audiences every month. Uh, it's, it's not enough just to go, oh, I'll do a Facebook Live. I hope some of my friends will come along. Um, you end up being like, feeling like you're this, this webinar billboard in the middle of the Sahara Desert. You know, it might be a great billboard, but there's no one there. Um, and it, and even, it's even worse if you have like two people turn up and everyone knows how many people are on the webinar. <laughs> I've been there, I've done that. So you, you want to have a system for getting an audience that's completely free because that's a really good price, everyone can afford that. That's high quality and that you can rinse and repeat month in, month out. First audience, every single month, hundreds of people preferably, thousands would be nice, or dozens even, you know, if you've got a premium price product. So I'll show you my system that gets a fresh audience of high quality people month in, month out, completely inexhaustible. I can rinse and repeat this for lifetimes to come. So that would be worth knowing about, right? And now it's going to be a bit of a head scratcher for some of you, but I'm happy to answer any and all questions you have. I will hold nothing back. System for getting audiences. The second thing you need is you need to build the webinar or the asset, as I call it, in a certain way. There's a sequence. If you give them too much information, they won't buy. If you put the information out of sequence, they won't buy. Uh, unless you make it simple. They won't buy. I learned all this the hard way. The enemy of motivation is complication. So you, you get to choose whether your PowerPoint, the asset that you're going to use, you get to choose whether it's going to be clear or comprehensive. This is a fundamentally critical mistake that almost everyone makes when they start marketing with webinars, me included. Let me say it again. You get to be clear or comprehensive. If you put your webinar together, answering the critic, you know, at the back of your mind, or, or being defensible to a colleague who might be able to pick holes in it, if you put it together so it's comprehensive enough to, to, to stack up to those sort of criticisms, you will lose everyone. Being clear and comprehensive are mutually exclusive. Any questions on that? Almost everyone makes that mistake. So that, that can save you a couple of years of presenting even to good sized audiences, not getting a response and wondering why. It's got to be so simple, literally, that a 12 year old without any understanding of your industry or your service can understand it, literally. That's how simple it's got to be. Okay, third thing you need is a call to action. You've got to give people at the end of your webinar a specific action to take, one action. 
not the option of two actions or three or four, one action. This is what you need to do now if you want to take a step further. And that, that call to action, social media doesn't work so well because social media is, is a nurture style media and it's not, it's not built or designed and neither should be to embed a call to action. So there's lots of different places you can get audiences from. Let's, let's talk about that for a moment. So um, Roger was kind enough to read my last book, Marketing with Webinars. Their audience is on Amazon and they're looking for books. That's an audience source. Our radio listeners, that's an audience. TV viewers are audience. Um, people on Facebook, there's an audience. LinkedIn has an audience. You can buy an email list legitimately and not spam anyone. That can be an audience. People driving on a freeway looking at a billboard, there's an audience. Audiences are the easiest thing in the world to find. If, if, you, if someone says to you, look, I've got a list of 10,000 people in your target market. I've got 10,000 leads. You say to them, no, you don't have 10,000 leads. You've got 10,000 contact details. There is a world of difference between a lead, which in my world is someone who's interested in my product or service versus the contact details. Yellow pages, when we used to have them, you know, you have a million people on the yellow pages. They weren't going to buy anything, but it's still an audience, right? So the source of your audiences is 70% of your success. Let me say that again. The source of your audience is where you get your audiences from. That's 70% of your success. So I won't buy an email list full of my ideal, ideal suspects because I know the source is pretty, is pretty poor quality. Okay, so there are lots of audiences. I want to tell you the best source to get fresh audiences. It's a bit of work, but by golly, it works well. I want to give you the best asset. Um, again, you know, books are an asset. Webinars are an asset. Um, a website is an asset. A five-day challenge is an asset. An e-guide is an asset. Um, the series of video sales letters are an asset. There's lots of different assets you can choose. Um, Twitter account can be an asset, but a Facebook group can be an asset. LinkedIn account, asset, assets everywhere. Last time I checked, I listed 115 different assets. But rather than give you them, I want to give you the best asset, which is the webinar. For reasons I've already explained, it just hits the sweet spot of inviting people to put enough skin in the game, but not too much, not to scare them off. But, but enough, not like speed dating, more like a, a, you know, a night out in a town. So what's the best source of audiences? Best asset, I've already told you, it's, it's webinars for, for those reasons and many, many more reasons. Webinars represent the best combination of efficiency and effectiveness. So of any marketing medium, it's the best combination of efficient and effectiveness. If you hire a conference setup after we've through COVID and you put say 500 bodies in that room and they're all come to hear you speak, that's going to be more effective than a webinar. But it's a lot of work and it's a lot of money. And I've done over 500 of those events. So I know a little bit about it. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'd have to, have to add, you know, generate millions of dollars doing that, hiring conference center, getting a lot of people in there and then sort of strutting my stuff on stage for a couple of hours or a day or two. So it works incredibly well, but it's not efficient. It's effective. Very well the difference between efficient and effective. Well, effectiveness and efficiency combined you're not going to beat webinars. If there is, you know, if there was a way that would be a better efficiency and effectiveness, I'd be doing it because, you know, I'm into what works. But lots of different audience options, lots of different assets options, webinars are the best, lots of different call to actions. The two primary call to actions from a webinar are either buy something or book something. Buy it or book it. So the buy it is where you ask people to pull the credit card out and it's typically $97 product or a $1,000 product. Maybe it's a $500 a month product, but that's probably about the limit you're not going to be selling $50,000 products off the back of a webinar. And if you're, if you need like almost everyone on here will need to have some sort of pre client engagement meeting with a prospect before they sign an agreement, and agree to work together. You've got to have that cup of coffee with them, whether it's digitally speaking with zoom or whatever. So for most of you, the most appropriate and effective call to action is going to be to offer people to book a consult. So that's rough terms. That's the, that's the model. Any questions coming through, Roger, or shall I keep rock and rolling? You are obviously mesmerizing people because there are no questions. I might be all asleep. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think so. Tom, at about the halfway mark, which is 15 minutes from now, uh, I, people are probably intrigued about your setup. 
okay. technical setup, your uh, big, your smart. Could you take a couple of minutes and explain how you created this effect? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can Great. do that. I'll let you know when we're at halfway. Okay. Uh, and for some reason, I'm just going to shut some applications down here because I think I'm running, must be running on a little RAM because my navigation for PowerPoint is just blacked out. It's kind of weird, but that's what it's done. So we will work with that somehow. Um, so it just means I can't go click to the next slide. I might have to just stop the PowerPoint and start it again. So just bear with me a moment, folks, while I do that. Oh, hmm. Let's see what happens if we come over here. No, it's not going to cooperate. So I'm just going to shut my PowerPoint down and see if we can't refresh it. Uh, discard, thank you, shut down. Hmm. Well, this gets weirder and weirder. You can see PowerPoint behind you, but it's not active on my screen. There we go. That's a bit more encouraging. And, you know, technology gremlins is just something you have to cope with when you're running webinars. And, and it's not that it only happens when you're presenting digitally, it will happen sometimes audio, audio visual systems will stop working, etc. Even even physical environments. Let's go back to the slide we were on. Ah, which is this one here. And we will leap back into life from that slide. I think we might be back in business. Yeah, there we go. Now I can navigate again. That's always helpful. So um, we've gone through the, the model. Uh, since then, I've written books about marketing with webinars, and there's a bunch of them on Amazon. And I've spoken on web stages with, about marketing with webinars with some real famous uh, people like uh, Dr. Ivan Meisner, who started Business Network International. This is Richard Koch, my favorite business author. He wrote uh, the, 80 the 8020 Principle. Uh, which sold over a million copies, an amazing book. Uh, my all-time favorite book, I'd have to say, other than outside of um, Sacred Texts. Uh, this is um, Michael from Get Book Solid, Brian Tracy, Brian Tracy International, Michael Gerber from the Emerson and so on. So it's spoken on what stage with people like that. Um, but probably that's not quite so important, but it, it probably just validates that people seem to think that the subject matter was some interest. Um, how well does it work? This is just a screenshot I took from last month's webinar. Uh, you can see August, this is August the 5th there. And I might just get my pen working again because I had to stop it to restart. Okay. Um, so back on track. So this is typical a monthly webinar of 747 people. So I run one in the morning, my time. Well, 4 p.m. Eastern, New York is 6 a.m. here. I run another one at 3 a.m. Eastern. That's for our Western European and British audiences. And it's the, as I said, right at the start, it's one of the things I love about webinars is, is the cultural diversity to reaching out to other people in the world. So this is typical. We typically have somewhere between 500 and 1,000 people registering for our webinar once a month. And that really gives, you know, if you have that sort of number, even if you have 10% of that, that really gives you that audience that you need straight off the bat. And at the end of most of my webinars, I offer people a call to action, which is to book a time to have a conversation. So this next screenshot is from our uh, schedule once, which is kind of like Calendly or time trade. So this shows you over a 90 day period, May the 1st to July 31, I had 72 people book a consult with me that attended the webinar. They knew what my pricing was. They uh, had confirmed that it was a good time for them to start working together. Should we agree that was a good idea? And I think I, I'm impressed with this. <laughs> I hope you are. 71 of them showed up. You know, 72 bookings, it's more than one per business day over a 90-day period and about a 99% show up rate. So it tells you they were pretty well qualified, but also quite motivated. So 
that's the uh, lots of people are registering for webinars, people following up afterwards, booking consults. And the next is the icky, the icky slide that shows my shopping cart sales. Uh, you can see down there an average of 97,000 that's US dollars per month in sales over the same period of time. So they can work quite well in terms of getting your big audiences, generating a lot of inquiries and then converting into sales. Um, let's just stop and pause. We can go into each part of the, the audience, how you get the audiences. We can go into how to build the asset so it's engaging, interesting and motivational content, uh, content. We can go into the call to action. But are there any questions right now before we shift to that part of the presentation? There are no probably, questions, Tom. So it's probably a good idea now to talk about the technology. Is it, is it Roger, you wanted to have oh, a... Well, why not take a couple of minutes? Uh, you're... Uh, uh, I, I would like this audience to know about it because yeah, this, sure. this is this is a unique uh, a view with you yeah. occupying the a third and then your content occupying the other two and I'm quite sure others would like to replicate this so please right. share with us how you do it. So so one of the beauties about this setup is that you don't need a green screen and you'll you'll I'm not doing a screen share. What I have behind me is a 75 inch 4K full color monitor. So this plugs into my computer, just the same as your desktop monitor does, except I have it positioned behind me. And because I like to fill the screen, uh, we, can, we can just you know zoom back in and fill the screen. So, what I want my audience to be looking at is the subject of, 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 I want them to be focused on the stuff I want them to look at. Now, when you run a webinar with this setup, people get to see your eyes and it's kind of in their face. You know, it's, it's big pictures. I'm not just stuck up on a little corner or the square somewhere. And the benefit of having this sort of technology, and you don't need it, by the way, but the benefit of having it is that we know that when people see our eyes, it'll stimulate oxytocin in their brain. And that's the chemical that's released when people start to feel they can trust you. So big screen webinars, I call these big screen webinars, interactive touch screen using PowerPoint, a wireless, when I say wireless, it's in my pocket, I can move around. And the audio quality doesn't vary. It's not dependent on me being close to the webcam. So the big screen is touchscreen interactive. It's the sort of thing you'd see in a university or maybe a college or a high school where, where teachers are presenting. Also, you'll see them in boardrooms for boardroom conferences where they're zooming people in from, from other parts of the world. I use it because it's, it's, it presents a level of engagement and interest and as a specialist who's, you know, says that he's quite good at marketing webinars, I believe I need to be at the leading edge. But you don't need it. You can just do a normal old PowerPoint presentation on your monitor without even having your webcam on, and that will work pretty darn well. I, the, the webcam I have is a Logitech Meetup. Meet up. It's expensive, you don't need it. But I love the fact that it comes with a remote control. So I can preset the width. Uh, and I could, you know, just well, zooming out, but we can zoom back in again as well. Lighting is really tricky with this setup. Because if I have the traditional video studio set up with lights on the side, you'll see massive look like sun flares with the lights bouncing off the screen behind me. So for lighting, I have floor lighting, which is, comes up, and I have ceiling lighting, which is positioned almost directly overhead, just slightly in front of me. And I think that's probably a summary of all the tech setup. So I'm, when I'm looking at, at you, I'm just staring straight into the webcam, pretending like I can see you with your lovely hair. So question from Ashok. Uh, so does it mean you are using two monitors? Yeah, I have. Actually, I've got three. Uh, in my office right now, I've got five, but you don't need five. You need two. 
you definitely need two monitors when you're doing webinars. You need to have a monitor, or in this case, it's this one where you're doing the screen share, and you have a second monitor where you've got your list of attendees, the questions are coming through, and all your audio controls are. It's, it's kind of tricky to run. You can run a webinar just on a laptop with, with hundreds of people, but it is definitely trickier. So you want to have you want to plug a second monitor into your laptop or a second monitor into your, your desktop. It'll make the whole navigation experience much easier for you. <clears throat> Tom, another question, this time related to your content, not your setup. How did you promote and market to get so many people attending with high attendance rate? The topic of my webinar could be very different, unlike marketing webinars topic which is appealing to the mass population of entrepreneurs or professionals. Well, if, if you could share with me what the, the subject matter is, what it is you're marketing, that would be helpful. Thank you, and who you're marketing it to. Heyman, why don't you uh, unmute and uh, answer Tom's questions? Yeah, hi. Uh, now, the topic could be anything that is related to my profession, that is business excellence, for example or getting some founding members for my newly developed or uh, you know, in, in process of development, the platform. Uh, so uh, it could vary. Uh, it could be on efficiency improvement. It could be on improving yeah. the time and you know, saving uh, yeah. money, something like that. Yeah, good question. Um, it sounds to me like it has reasonably broad appeal. I mean, marketing webinars would have less broad an appeal because a lot of people hate the idea of webinars. I mean, I've got a friend that literally makes her nauseous when she thinks about presenting a webinar. <laughs> and she's very good on stage too, which is kind of weird the technology just scares her off. So I wouldn't say you don't have a problem with the, the breadth of scope. What you actually have a problem with is almost the opposite, is how do you make that so specific that it's gonna get cut through? Because business excellence is not gonna get cut through. Leadership training is not gonna get cut through. These are words that people use commonly and so we think we know what they mean and we don't therefore register an interest in them. So the unconscious is interested in the avoidance of pain, the pursuit of pleasure, or the realization of potential. But if it thinks it already knows what a thing is or how to do a certain thing, then, then we become quite complacent. So, so the trick with something like that is to be able to articulate the magic in such a way that people, it gets cut through, it gets people's attention. And uh, SB, nice looking dog, give him a kiss for me. I've got one in my heart, <laughs> give me a mark. So the trick is to articulate what it is that you're gonna to wanna to be marketing in such a way that people notice it and are motivated to wanna to know more. And very often it's around specificity. We, we, if people want, we can go into the most important part of the whole content sequence, which is the title. How do you put a title together so that it gets cut through and motivates people to wanna to know more? There's a three-step process to that. Is that enough now for Roger? At yeah, the, okay. Yeah, no, thanks. No, thanks, Haman. No further questions, Tom. Okay. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Uh, so the, 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 the other thing I'd add to that is for goodness sakes, don't disqualify yourself. If you have tried marketing webinars that hasn't worked, please don't give up on it because very often it's just uh, some tweaks that you need to make it work. But the title is certainly one of them. Um, you, you, you can't have a title that has people thinking, yeah, I know what I know all about that, or I've heard all that before, because they, they just won't respond to it. I mean, as Coco Chanel said, you know, in order to be indispensable, one must be different. So why, why, don't we, why don't we head back to the sort of the heart and soul of this, which is the three parts to the model, the, the audience, the asset, and what we might do is, is we might, um, I, I'm gonna give you some options but first of all, I'll explain very briefly how the model works out. So the very best source of audience is other people's networks. I call it OPM, that's the acronym. Um, I joined the, the AMS, but it didn't really stick. That's the Acronym Minimization Society. The AMS, as I now call it, but it didn't work. That was a joke. And it, yes, it is sad when you have to tell people that you just made a joke, but there you go. Uh, so. OPN stands for other people's networks. You might know them as host beneficiary or joint venture. My way of doing things is not the same as that. That's why I came up with a different word for a different phrase. More specifically, these are people who have email subscriber lists. Now that is critically important. Not LinkedIn connections, not Facebook group members, not Twitter followers, 
not Facebook friends, not Instagram followers, email subscriber lists. Okay, that's really, really important. Remember I said before that source is very, that's a, it's a critical determinant of your success. Email subscriber lists. And those people are going to promote your webinar. They're not going to give you their email list. They're going to send emails out to their subscribers, inviting their subscribers to attend your webinar without you paying them any money to do that. Okay, we can talk about more about why would they do that <laughs> and how do you get to the point where they're going to do that. But you saw before the 740 something webinar registrants we have pretty much every single month between 500 and 1,000. They all come from other people's networks. Other people who have email lists who have sent out an invitation for their subscribers to attend my webinar. And you can do exactly the same thing. You may not think you can, but you can. Okay, so that's other people's networks is the number one source of fresh audiences, completely free, rinse and repeatable month in, month out for as many lifetimes as you, can, as you want. It's just an inexhaustible supply. North America is my happy hunting ground for this. I mean, the reason I target the good old USA is that people in the States, God bless them, they wake up every morning wondering where they can, wondering where they can spend their money. Whereas the Europeans, God bless them, they wake up every morning wondering where they, how they can save their money. So it shouldn't take too much, too long for you to decide which market is going to be more responsive, uh, the, the American. So, but I mean, I have clients all over the world, but just the Americans are faster to buy, generally speaking. So the, Tom, the audience has come. Tom, a question from uh, Stephen, the prophet doctor. How do you yeah. find them? That means how do you find other people's networks? Easiest thing in the world. I'll show you how to do that. The harder part is to engage with them, but let's, let's talk about that as well. I, I, we're definitely going to spend some time on that, uh, Stephen, because it's, it's core to making this whole thing work, is getting the audiences. So I'll show you exactly how we do it. Thank you for the question. So we're going to get other people's networks driving audiences to register for your webinar, and then you're going to offer them a consult at the end. That's the traditional model. That's strategically speaking, pretty straightforward. But let's, let, let me give you the remote control and you can tell me which part of the audience system you want me to share about. And I'm going to give you three options and you can just type one, two or three into the, into the chat. Number one is how to get free quality audiences from other people's networks. Number two is how do you get the right people to attend so that you've got people that are more likely to buy when you do run your webinar, that has to do with putting titles together. And number three is, is it's possible to actually generate three to five times the number of inquiries by having more than just your webinar as an asset. Would you like to know about developing other assets beyond? Webinar is the first thing you should do because that's where the low lying fruit is. Um, if you've got time, we can do them all, but um, and why wouldn't you ask that? But, but <laughs> We're getting Good. one three and the rest are ones and twos equal split. <laughs> so which one do I share on one, two or three? I think you, have to, you, you have to make that choice. Uh, there's lot, I think there's more ones than there are twos or threes. Right. Why don't we see if we can get through uh, Yeah, two, one, one, two, one, three, two, three, two, three, two, one, two. Okay. Well, pretty well split one and two. Okay, let, 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 me, let me do the first two here real quick, okay, rather than just one of them in detail. So the, the first one is around uh, finding other people's networks, right? So getting people to, to promote your webinar, and that's a big part of solving your audience. So free high quality audiences, and this is what I call the OPN system. And just, just to refresh your memory, this, this is what we're doing here. We're getting other people's networks, but if we want to look at the whole system, there's more to the audience system. What we're going to do is we're going to get a freelancer from the Philippines. I like the Filipinos because their English is impeccable. And I can hire someone there for 5 to $7 an hour. Let's say $5 an hour for five hours a week to find me, my partners. And we have a checklist that we give her. So remember, everything is, everything is a system. So my Filipino freelancer, I'm giving five hours a week 
and I'm paying her typically five to seven dollars an hour. That's my overhead. I also pay her a very generous monthly bonus, which typically amounts to hundreds more dollars. So for someone working as a part-time gig five hours a week at a laptop in the Philippines, earning hundreds of dollars every month, it's pretty good money. Right? It might sound like it's kind of a sweatshop thing if you're in US or, or Australia, but it's pretty good money for them and they're pretty, pretty happy to get to work. So they have a checklist and there's five knockout factors. So if you want to find audiences, easiest thing in the world. So just type in your ideal client description, let's say business coaches and the word webinar. And then you're going to find thousands of people running webinars for business coaches, or you can type in manufacturer webinar and you'll find hundreds, if not thousands of people who are running webinars for manufacturers. So all you have to do to find your potential OPN partners is go to Google, type in the word webinar and a description of your target market. It's very simple. So that, that part's pretty easy. And I'll show you how we engage them, those, those people in a moment. But to start with, there's a checklist and there's five knockout factors. So let's say my freelancer in the Philippines who's giving five hours of her time each week for me. She's going to do that. She's going to search in Google. Management consultant or business coach or SaaS developer webinar. She'll find someone and she will go through the checklist. Do they feature themselves on the website? Check number one. Yes or no. If it's a no, reject. Number two, are they actively marketing with webinars? If that's a yes, they stay on the checklist. If it's a no, reject. Do they have a quality offering? Or are they hype merchants or BS artists? If they're hype merchants or BS artists, reject. If they've got quality content, then they stay on the checklist. So I'm not doing any of this, remember. This is being initiated by a freelancer who's filling in a Google sheet, going through the five checklists. We, if they get through the checklist, by the way, we have an algorithm. And I spent nine months and far too much money with data scientists so that once we identified someone who got through the five knockout factors, as we call them, we could put their website into an automated algorithm and it would predict how many webinar registrants that partner would be likely to generate for my webinar. So just for clarification, is, Tom, uh, these, the source of these OPNs are people currently marketing to your target market. Correct. Thank you. And, uh, and because you're wanting to do where this is leading is you're going to offer to promote their webinar and they will reciprocate and offer to promote your webinar. That's, that's where we're heading to. But if you email them, having gone through the checklist and having put them through the algorithm or not, it's not critical, just helpful. And you say, Hey, look, I noticed you do webinars for describe your target market. Would you be interested in having a conversation about how we could support each other? Then guess what you'll hear? Nothing. <laughs> Why? Because you basically, it's kind of like you just proposed marriage to them, but you haven't had a first date yet. Quick story. I'm in the kitchen with my wife having coffee. True story. In this house a couple of years ago. And I said to her, I don't know, I don't know to, to the start, I don't know why I asked her, but, but I said, who do you think the world's most irresistible man is? Pretty silly question to ask your wife. And anyway, she, eventually she came up with Hugh Jackman. Uh, ah, Hugh Jackman. Ah, he's got, you know, I mean, he's pretty good looking. If you've seen him in Wolverine, you know he's got a body that Adonis would die for with his sort of rippling chest and six pack and everything, biceps. And uh, I knew he happened to be, I happened to know he was a philanthropist and environmentally aware and community sort of guy. Or if, uh, I thought, um, I said to me, yeah, Hugh Jackman, I get that. He's, he's pretty good looking and so on and so on and so on. I said, well, can tell, tell me this. If there was a knock at the front door right now, it was me talking to my wife. And I said, 
And you went and answered the front door. You swung the door open. It was Hugh Jackman standing there. And he dropped to one knee and he held up a small red velvet box and he popped the top up and he said, you don't know me, but my name's Hugh Jackman. Would you, would you make me the happiest man on earth? Would you marry me, run away with me right now and live with me for the rest of your life? I said, well, what would you say to him? It's Hugh Jackman, just proposed to you. And my, my wife looks at me and she says, well, you know, I love you, right? I said, yeah, I don't think I know what's coming next. <laughs> She said, well, I'm sorry, kind of blurted it out. I'm sorry, I'd run away with him. I mean, it's Hugh Jackman. And um, I said to her, you know, wiping a tear out of the corner of my eye, <laughs> I said to her, I don't think you need to apologize. She said, why is that? I've just told you I'd run away with Hugh Jackman. I said, look, if there was a knock at the front door right now, and it was me, Tom, I put my coffee down, I went to the front door, I opened it, and it was Hugh Jackman, he proposed to me, I would run away. And I'm not even gay. I mean, it's Hugh freaking Jackman, you know? So, <laughs> so and I'll tell you that story because a lot of people practice what I call Hugh Jackman marketing. They find a prospect and they propose. And it's too soon. It's a premature proposition. We've got to give people the first date. So I talked about prospects before and how about the webinar was that first date. It was like a night out on the town together, a restaurant, a show, maybe coffee at my place or something afterwards. Whereas social media is more like speed dating. There's not enough skin in the game. Proposing that you talk about working together is too much skin in the game. We need to find that sweet spot. Just, just like we can't propose like Hugh Jackman would and get away with it because we're not the commercial equivalent of Hugh Jackman. We have to warm people up. We've got to give them a first date. So what we do is we've identified this. My Filipino contractor, Michelle, has identified someone that could probably do a great job of promoting my webinar because they've got a decent email list and they're actively marketing and so on. But rather than approach them and say, hey, why don't we do a webinar swap or something? What we do is we get them onto my podcast show. So all of my clients have podcasts. Virtually none of them have blogs, but they all have podcasts. And this is the first date. This prevents us from knocking at the front door and proposing marriage, so to speak. This is the equivalent of the night of the town. So we, we get the right person because we've put them through quite a rigorous quality control process, if you like, not quality of them as a human being, but the fit for them being able to be an OPM partner. And we get them on the podcast and we interview them, we get their message out to the marketplace. We give them voice. And thus we invoke psychological reciprocity, which is the most powerful force in marketing, bar none, and yet it's the least spoken about, psychological reciprocity. This, this plays out in our little estate here at Castaways Beach every other week when a neighbor says, hey, Come over for dinner. I take the call, you know. Come over for dinner. I, yeah, we're going to say to my wife, are you okay to go to Sally Russell's for dinner Friday night? She says, yeah, what do we bring? I said, well, I asked, they said, bring nothing. My wife says, doesn't mean bring nothing. I said, well, that's what they said. I said yeah, yeah, but so we take flowers, we take wine, we take chocolates, whatever. We take half the supermarket, you know, we give them that, go for dinner. The next day, why, why, are we, why do we feel compelled to do that? Well, men don't, but women do. Because of psychological reciprocity, they're putting on an evening for us and a dinner and they're going to a lot of work. So you've got to do something to reciprocate. Unconsciously, we like to keep the score even. And the next day, you know, we come back, we have a good time, we come back home. The next day we wake up and there's flowers on the front doorstep because Sally, because we gave them too much. And now she's got to keep the score even. And this can go on for freaking weeks. <laughs> That's the power of reciprocity. So when we do something, we find the right person, when we put them through our quality control process, we get them on a podcast and give them voice. It's very easy then to say, hey, you know, I noticed that you're, we've got the same target market. What, why don't we have the conversation about growing each other's followers or lists or whatever? And, and then they bite your hand off and they go, hell yeah, I'd love to do that. And so now we've got someone that wants to support the webinar. Now, let me stop you right there. Because you're going to say to me, yeah, but I don't have much of an email list. Right? So virtually none of my clients have any sort of email list when they start working with me. Here's my newsflash. 
We're all born naked. None of us came out with an email list. So start one. That's what I'm saying. Doesn't matter if you've got five people on it, start. Goethe, the great German philosopher and playwright and, and uh, quasi-politician said, the genius and the power and the magic is in the beginning of a thing. And I'm paraphrasing him, of course. But he said, yeah, that's, that's the, the boldness of the initiation of an action. That's where all manner of circumstances come to one's aid that one could never have foreseen. So whatever you dream of beginning, begin it, start it now, because that's where the genius, the power and the magic is. To start an email list, start your LinkedIn group or your Facebook group or whatever you want to do, but start an email list because that becomes the trading point. That becomes the trade. So my, you know, our email, email list, we, we get about a thousand organic new subscribers every month, which is real cool. We don't buy emails. Um, and I'm not saying that to show off. I'm just, you know, it's, it's, it's about communicating with you that the starting is important because we started with a dozen or more and then you can build. Now we've got around 30,000 subscribers and they're mostly active because we give them good quality podcasts every week. So this is where you get your audiences from. This, this is the audience system here. Rinse and repeat, week in, week out, month in, month out. Free, high quality, inexhaustible. Why, why would you do Facebook ads costing you 10 to $12 per email registrant when you can get them for free? And I can tell you, believe me or not, I don't mind, but we've done the stats because I've run Facebook campaigns for years before they got too expensive. And I can tell you that an email subscriber from someone else's list is 20 times more likely to buy from me than a Facebook lead, someone who's come from a Facebook ad, 20 times. And I'm paying 10 to $12 for that subscriber from the Facebook ad versus completely free from someone else's network. Questions? Tom, there's just one. Uh, what is the fifth knockout? The fifth way of eliminating uh, potential? I remember. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can remember. So there's, they've got to feature themselves on the website. Oh yeah. They've got to have, if you've got a service, they've got to have a service. They can't have a physical product. There's number five. So you might have someone who provides, say, laptops, say our target market of business coaches, professionals, uh, consultants. So let's say we've got somebody who sells laptops for that market and they've got this massive email list of clients. Fantastic. But it won't work if they promote me. And, and vice versa, it won't work if I promote their laptops. Because it, it's a funny thing, but people are used to hearing from a laptop person about hardware and from a service-based person about services. So it doesn't work when you try and cross promote one to the other. Two more questions. Uh, yep. Are you offering the JV partner a percentage of sales? And the next no. question, what is your feeling on offering summits? And the next one, did you say you didn't have a podcast? How would you know what other value to provide to the list owners individually? Okay, so the first question, now we don't offer commissions uh, to people who are supporting our webinar. We offer reciprocation. And the most important thing for the partners we reciprocate with is not how many email subscribers you have, but it's the quality of your presentation. So a case in point, I'm happy to promote, Roger's got some events coming up in December and we're happy to promote, uh, to support and to promote his without any reciprocation, simply because I know the quality and care that Roger puts into absolutely everything that he does. So when I send an email out on Roger's behalf to promote his webinars, I know that my email subscribers are going to be very happy with their experience of Roger. So that's the most important thing that your OPN hosts, the mature ones will be looking for is do you have great quality content? And we can talk about how to develop great quality content in a moment. So don't think that if you don't have an email list, you've got nothing to trade with. It's the content that's more important than anything else. Uh, the second question was about summits. Um, summits can be terrific. Uh, it's, it's a great way to grow an email list very quickly is to have a panel. A panel is basically a simple form of a summit, but a summit is where you have a series of experts come along and present. Um, provided you get the right experts, it, it can be, but it's, it's like herding cats. It's, a, oh, God, it's a lot of work. 
just start with webinars. Uh, you know, the simple, the fairly self-contained, the one-off, and there's this very short direct line between stimulus and response, between input and outcome. And the third question was, so you didn't have a, you don't have a podcast, how would you know what other value to provide to the list owners individually? No idea. Start a podcast. <laughs> so the, po the podcast is not about the podcast. So the podcast is not about providing um, about listeners or downloads, it's about the guest. And, and Kyle has quite rightly divined that, I suppose, you know, concluded that because because he's talking about, you know, how do you provide value to that to that person, that potential OPN host. Um, that the podcast is the best way of doing it, Kyle, because you could offer to reblog their their blogs or retweet their tweets or promote whatever. And you could invoke reciprocity like that. But the beautiful thing about a podcast, the way we do them certainly, is this webcam's on. And so you've got that oxytocin happening because they're looking at you and you're looking at them. So it's not the same as a physical meeting, but by golly, it's really close. So it's um, in, in this book, Marketing Invisible, which was a couple of books back now, um, I talk about the, the four forces of psychological allure, or the four levels, which are respect, rapport, relatability, and reciprocity. So it's very easy to get to the deepest level of respect, rapport, relatability, reciprocity very quickly when you're interviewing someone. So it, it's, it's the best way of doing it. Yeah, Facebook is, um, is terrific for some markets. It's not so good for others. Um, you know, it's not great for manufacturers, for the legal profession, for politicians, for, so, but, but it's good for business coaches, um, you know, social media people, it works pretty well for them. Um, what else we got? Uh, Facebook groups, really hard to get a lot of engagement in Facebook groups. We've got 2,500, 2, 2,500 members in ours, but it's really hard to get engagement there because a lot of people are members of lots of different groups and they can only cope with so much content at any given point in time. Um, so e e you really want to focus on building those email subscriber lists, folks. Any, any other questions I've missed there, Roger? No, we're, you're right up to date. Okay. So that's, that's explained how, how we get fresh audiences. We do also get audiences from LinkedIn, but LinkedIn doesn't work the way most sales trainers will tell you it works. Most sales trainers will tell you that what you want to do is identify your avatar on LinkedIn, make a list of them, then send them valuable content over a 90-day period, maybe videos, maybe articles, whatever. And then once you've built up your brand in their brain, then you propose that they, they might want to think about talking with you about becoming a client. Um, but LinkedIn doesn't work like that because it's it's the actual the reverse prioritization in the audience's minds versus a, a subscriber, an email subscriber. So what what's the order of priority when you have an email subscriber log in, to, you know, not log in, but opt into your list for a free guide or a webinar, or whatever? Their interest is not first and foremost you. Sorry, it's the benefit of what you do. And pe people are not interested in me whatsoever until they're clear that I can show them how to generate new client inquiries. Once I've established an interest in the benefit of what I do, then certainly they want to validate my professional ability and integrity and all the rest of it. But that's the order of priority with an email subscriber, benefit of the service, number one. Number two is the person behind that. With LinkedIn, it's the other way around. And this is why nurturing on LinkedIn is really hard to make work. With LinkedIn, the order of priority is the person first. Remember email subscribers, it was the benefit of working with you first. With, with LinkedIn, it's the other way around. It's they're interested in the person first. And the reason for that is really simple. There's two categories of people on LinkedIn. Recruitment category. They either want to recruit people or be recruited. Or keep their profile polished in case there's a headhunter out there wants to, wants to headhunt them. Second category, people want to sell stuff to you or your network. Influencers. There is no third category of people on LinkedIn who wake up every morning wondering, going, oh, goody, I'll log into LinkedIn in case I can buy something. That would be cool. No, that category doesn't exist. The best thing you can do with LinkedIn is have a freelancer contacting your suspects, people you suspect might be interested, and reaching out to them and inviting them to attend your webinar. That's the best thing you can do. 30, 30 to 33% will accept the connection request. 2.5% will register for your webinar. 60 to 70% will turn up. And on small boardroom briefing style webinars with webcams on, maybe six or eight people, then you can pick up 10% of them as clients. So those are the ratios. 
So to make, make LinkedIn work really well, forget automated platforms. Can you make it work with automated platforms? Yes, you can, but it's very difficult. Best thing you can do is have a small team of freelancers contacting your suspects and inviting them to your webinar. So you create a second webinar stream or audience stream by having this identification of suspects come into your webinar and it's the same, same consult, same call to action. So we talk about creating content because we've got done a little bit on the audience. So we talk about, what do you think? The asset. Yeah, there were lots, lots of votes for number two. Oh, number two was what? For content. Sorry, I can't remember. Oh, I, I, think, I think we've done the audience system because we had a uh, free quality audience tra attracting the right people. Should we go to content or should we go to attracting the right people? Your call, Roger. Sorry to put this on you, but you probably know better than I would. Uh, I think uh, con uh, blah, 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 blah. Let's, let's shoot for content. Okay. And then we can come back to, to that if we, if we have time. Yeah, the, the votes so, so, are coming in, they, they want content. Okay, so let's start with the most important part of your content, with your t which is your title. Because your title, it's got to get cut through. Number one, it's got to get noticed. And secondly, it's got to motivate people not only to register, but also to attend your webinar. And that two do very different things. So to explain how this works, imagine the forest. And in the forest, there's a hundred sleeping bears. And we happen to know through some magical process that three of them are hungry and you've got some honey. Now in our analogy with the hundred sleeping bears, three of them are hungry. The bears are a metaphor for prospective clients and the honey is a metaphor for your service. So just play along with me here. We've got a hundred sleeping bears, three of them are hungry but they're all asleep. How do we get the bears to eat you hungry? How do we find out which of the three bears are actually hungry? We've got a couple of choices. We can go running into the forest and find a bear and poke it in the bum with a really sharp stick and wake it up. And we wave our honey pot in front of its nose. And if it's one of the hungry ones and it's hunger exceeds its anger, <laughs> it eats our honey, right? But if it's one of the ones that wasn't hungry, it's going to be seriously pissed off and you better be a fast runner because it doesn't want your honey. It's just annoyed that it got woken up. So that's, this is outbound marketing. This is sent in, sending out 10,000 direct mail letters to people. We have no idea that they have an interest in your service. It's Hugh Jackman marketing, you know, offering a proposal before we know if they have an interest. We don't know if where the hungry bears are. It's cold calling. It's going to networking meetings, putting your business cards in front of people and have no idea if they're interested in service. Why? That's outbound marketing. The beautiful thing about webinars is it's inbound marketing. And all we're going to do is we're going to put the honey pot outside the forest and the hungry bears are going to wake up because they smell the honey and then they come out and they're going to sample your honey. And the honey pot is a metaphor for the title of your webinar. The title of your webinar is going to be emailed to thousands of people in other people's email lists and the hungry bears are gonna wake up and go, oh, I want that, I want that honey, okay. So the title is the most important part of your content, therefore, because if it, if it doesn't, if people, it doesn't get cut through and people don't even notice it, it's not gonna get acted on. So it's gotta be, gotta get cut through and it's gotta get acted on. So how do you put a title together? Three-step formula. First thing is you need to make sure it's benefit rich. Second thing is it's got to contain specifics. And number three, it's got to be differentiated. So it's got to sound different to what all your competitors are offering, whether those competitors are offering in Facebook ads or YouTube videos or however they're offering it, it's got to sound different. Now, let me, let me just say that there is a world of difference between you having a cup of coffee with someone, or as my New Jersey client says, I love the way in New Jersey, they put an R in the word coffee. It becomes coffee. I had a coffee with this guy, right? And I love that, Bronx, New Jersey, coffee. So you have a coffee with someone and after about 20 or 30 minutes, let's assume that they're an ideal client. So they've got the money to pay for your services and they want what you've got and 
It's like, wow, this is cool. You're having a coffee with this person. <laughs> and um, they ask you about how you work with your clients and you explain how it all works and what the benefit is and what your fees are and everything else. And they go, oh, that sounds great. We should, we should, you know, maybe we should, we could work together. And you said, terrific. You sign them up as a client. Great. So that's, most of you can do that. Right? Most of you have a coffee with someone who's an ideal prospect. You can articulate your value proposition, tell them how it works. And they go, yeah, let, let's do it. 70, 90% of the time, you're going to sign them up as a client. Yep. Yeah? Right. But that's on the left-hand side of the canyon. That's not scalable. That's one-on-one. What I need to do is we need to get that 40-minute conversation that you had over the coffee, and we need to communicate that in about five seconds, just like someone was driving past a billboard on a freeway. And you put your value proposition on that billboard, it's got to be that succinct. If you want to get from the left-hand side of the canyon, which is unpredictable, unscalable, to the right-hand side of the canyon, which is predictable and scalable, you've got to stick it on a billboard. And it's no good just doing a description of what your talk's about. It's got to be contained specifics. And it's got to sound different to everyone else. How my clients in time, team times, time zones around the world are using webinars to predictably generate quality and value client inquiries. So remember our three ingredients, we wanted it to be benefit rich. And I think you'll agree that predictability of new clients, having quality inquiries is, is pretty benefit rich. It's got to contain specifics in your title. 19 time zones around the world using webinars, that's pretty specific. And very often, if you get the specificity right, you get the differentiation. Uh, Joe's saying this is the same basic thing as your marketing message. Depends what you mean by a marketing message, Joe. But USP, Unix Sales Proposition, Elevator Pitch, yeah, it's in the ballpark, right? But it's not an elevator pitch and it's not a USP because they are generally designed to be communicated verbally in a short space of time. With the title, you do get a little longer. People, when they're reading, will be able to assimilate more information than when they're listening, most people. So this billboard test for your title is pretty good. Well, let me give you a couple of before and after examples. So let's go to Maxtel Software. He's a client. Create great point of sale, POS, point of sale, QSRs as quick service restaurants. In, in, in the industry that he works in, that's McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, right? Fast food joints. So that's what he would say. Come along and we'll show you some great point of sale software if you're in the quick service industry. But it's not really benefit rich. And it doesn't really contain any specifics apart from POS. And it's certainly not differentiated from what his competitors are all complaining, you know, point of sale. This is the software they use at the cash register, the counter at McDonald's and so on. So we applied the formula and we mixed it up a bit. And we said, we increased the sales and profit in QSRs by 25% within 90 days, guaranteed. Do you think they wanted to know about that? Hell yes. But do you think they wanted more point of sale software? Hell no. <laughs> so by getting specific and making it benefit rich, we transformed it, formed it from a boring message that didn't get cars or didn't get noticed into something that people wanted to find out about. Now, it doesn't have to be a commercial uh, benefit. Uh, let me introduce you to Karen, who's in Canada, who's an anxiety counselor. So that's what she does. That's the answer to the question, what do you do for a living? But when you want to put it in a webinar title, what we need is we need to make a benefit rich, et cetera. So we came up with Rewire Your Mind, trademark, a simple three-step model to easily shift you from stressing to progressing in less than 30 days. Now. If I suffer from anxiety, God forbid, because it's a terribly debilitating thing, and I saw anxiety counseling, I might be interested. But if I think there's something proprietary, and I can shift from stressing to progressing in less than 30 days with a simple three-step model, now I'm interested. So that's the first step in creating content, is you get the title right. Let me, let, me, let me give you the second major part here. And there are eight objectives to achieve when you're marketing webinars. 
Um, we, 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 first and foremost, we, you, you have to demonstrate your capability to deliver on the promise in the title. That's the most important objective. If you succeed at all seven other objectives, which is the elimination of um, comp direct competitors, the eradication of hurdles and so on, the qualification, so on and so on, you can succeed at all the other seven objectives if you don't demonstrate your capability to deliver on the promise in the title, it's all for nothing. So beyond that, let me, let me share with you the concept conveyor. This is how you create content. Tom, just a little time check. We've got eight minutes to go. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Um, this is how you create, get an idea that you want to communicate and you communicate it in a way that's memorable and engaging and that people derive value from. Because this is, you know, part of the 50% of people where, where people don't market with webinars is they don't have to put the content together. So that it's interesting, engaging, memorable. So the first thing you do uh, is you come up with a label for what it is you're doing. <clears throat> you give it a title. And as soon as you give something a title, it becomes a real thing and it's proprietary. 100 sleeping bears. Does that ring a bell? Hugh Jackman marketing. Does that ring a bell? So every time I want to communicate a concept to you in a way that's engaging and interesting and memorable, I've given it a title. I haven't just told you that we shouldn't do outbound marketing, we should do inbound marketing. I told you about 100 sleeping bears. I haven't just told you that you need to give people the opportunity to get to know you before you propose. I've told you about Hugh Jackman marketing. So we give this thing a label, that's number one. And then you overview and you say, I'm gonna tell you about you know, the 100 sleeping bears and why you should engage in inbound marketing versus outbound marketing. Or I'm gonna tell you about Hugh Jackman marketing and I'll tell you why we need to really give people that opportunity for a first date before we propose. So we give that an overview. And this is the core here. You come up with a simile or a metaphor or an analogy or a story. And you communicate your point through that medium. That's what brings it to life. So the way I do this is I say, okay, I want to make this point. Let's say I want to make this point about the fact that you really need to give people opportunity to get to know you first. What's that like? And that's what I ask myself. What's that like? And this has never failed me in over 30 years of doing presentations. I want to make a point. I ask myself, what's that like? What's that like? How could I express that in a simile, a metaphor, an analogy or a story? And by the way, you know, Christ, Buddha, Muhammad did this, right? They talked in stories or, or metaphors or analogies, etc. And they ended up with billions of followers between them. So we're doing, you know, there's got to be something in that. Okay. So you come up with a story um, and then step four is you give them an example in step five of, of what you're just talking about here. In step five is you make a recommendation, you know, therefore what I recommend is that instead of going to conferences, I recommend you run webinars because it's the perfect sweet spot in terms of skin of the game, not too much, not too little. And then finally you take questions. Any questions? There are no questions. Okay, let me, before we shut out, close out, let me give an example of a call to action. Um, <laughs> Cause I should really do that. Some of you, if you wanna know more, you can go and uh, go to this URL. Dramatic pause, go to this URL, push a button. And we can have a conversation as to whether you wanna put this into place in your business. So book a chat with tom.com. Um, the other thing about going to that URL is that you'll see how I do a call to action and you'll see how I qualify people, price point, uh, timing, readiness to start. It's all, it's all of that page there. So you can go there and book a time with me, but even if you don't want to book a time, that's fine. Just go there and have a look at how I do the call to action because this is the page, swipe and deploy this. Because this, this is where you want to direct people at the end of your webinar to a page like this where they can make an inquiry. Don't have a long URL like leadsology.guru forward slash heist and forward slash book, forward slash book, you know, don't have that. Make it something nice and simple. They just go there 
um, and they end up on a page that looks like that. And at the bottom of that, let me just resize that a little bit so I'm not having to have a rubber neck. You'll see that you ask them for these agreements, these check boxes here, and they have to check all the four boxes about affordability and readiness to start, et cetera. And at the bottom, they click on the link and your calendar will come up and they can book a time to talk with you. That's what we do. So happy, I've got time to take questions, uh, but Roger, I, it's up to you as to, so about, time's up. It's, it's 7, 8, 27, we can take uh, one question. If my product is $297, is it okay to send people directly to the sales page? And on the sales page at the very end, I can offer people the opportunity to book if they aren't ready to buy. Yeah, absolutely, Andrea, absolutely. So that's, that's the other call to action. Uh, it's called the Godfather offer. But there's, there's quite a lot to do with that. If you want to email me, I'll send you some information about how to make an offer on the webinar. But there's quite a lot to it um, because there's, it's, it's not like you want to do, be an infomercial. <laughs> you know? But wait, there's more. But you do want to stack benefits and you want to stretch the price and shrink them. And most importantly, Andrea, is you must give people a reason to buy now rather than later. It might be midnight tonight or whenever. But if you don't give them a deadline, then they'll go away and think about it. And even though they intend to think about it, they'll get distracted by another shiny thing and forget all about your offer. Would you record your webinar to make it available on our website to potential clients whenever they want to watch? No. Um, and the reason is that it has to do with engagement, Dwight, because when people know it's a replay, they'll go and clear their emails while they're playing your webinar in the background or they'll check the Facebook feed. So you don't get their undue attention. And that means that you're going to have a poor response rate. Evergreen webinars will work if they're incredibly short, like less than 10 minutes. And if you have high traffic flows to them. Um, but other than that, you're better to do the live ones. My, my take on, I mean, I run, you know, a lot of webinars every year. And, and sometimes people say to me, why don't you just record it and have it evergreen? And my answer is that, when we onboard a new client, I want them to understand that I care deeply about their implementation and that I'm there personally to help them in real time, to jump on a call with them, to show them how to implement. And I like my marketing to be aligned. I want my, my prospect's experience to be reflective of my client's experience. And if I am automating the webinar, essentially what I'm saying is you are going to be processed when you become a client. I'm going to automate everything. I'm not really going to be there for you. I'll just have my IP automated. So by having a live experience like this one, hopefully I'm sending a signal to people and saying, I care enough to be here. Um, we also offer a 30 day free test drive. So if people want to dive on in, they don't have to pay any money. Uh, you can read more about that at, at the book of chat page. Roger. I think we, it is 8.30, so let's keep our word to our attendees. Uh, uh, that's what BBN does. We start on time and we end on time. It's just part of our culture. Tom, on behalf of BBN, I want to thank you profoundly for sharing of your time, your wisdom, your three decades of experience. Uh, I am certain that everyone uh, got great value for the time they invested in joining you this evening. Terrific. Thanks I for the invitation, you. Roger, and thanks, everyone. It's my total pleasure, Tom. It's been a slice of a little slice of heaven. Good night to you all. <laughs>